So are you a plant beginner that wants to move towards kind of intermediate or expert level? Stick with me and I will do a show and tell of some of the plants that I think after years of owning a large collection of plants might be a good next stepping stone in your plant owning journey. Hi, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So in this video, I'm going to go through my top five, and I think, and I've got a list, I think there's a bonus one for pretty much each one of the five. So top five or top ten, depending on how you... <laughs> <laughs> how you want to look at it. The top five I'll go into a bit more detail and by that I mean I will give you kind of indications about its speed, its pest pressures, propagation, its care and any of those idiosyncrasies. The other thing I will say is I specifically chose different plants for this. So there's a carnivorous plant, there is anthuriums in this, there are philodendrons in this, there are hoyas in this and there are also Syngoniums in this. So I thought I'd give you a kind of wide mix. Now the plants that I have chosen are not the same ones. I don't think that everybody else is going, yeah, these are the easiest next step. I thought I'd give you some of the ones that after owning plants for a while might not be known as the plant that you'd go into from beginner kind of common plants into more uncommon or rare plants just to kind of mix it up a bit and give you a few more options. So you're not kind of going for the standard, if you want to go for anthuriums, try a clarinervium first. Yeah, maybe, I think maybe it's just because I'm a bit jaded because when I was doing that and I went for the clarinervium first, I killed it off fast. Maybe it wasn't fast. It was a slow, painful death basically. But <laughs> in that spirit, I want to give you some other options to maybe consider if you're kind of going to take that next step basically. So let's start off with the first one and I will show you one of them. So the first one I want to talk about is the plant that I've got here and it might look a bit janky but this is almost a three-year-old plant now. This is a Nepenthes and sometimes known as a pitcher plant, monkey jars, whole different host of names. This is obviously, obviously I say this, you might not know this, this is a carnivorous plant. So there are pitchers that come off the leaves in with, I don't know what this would be, I think this might be the petiole still. It looks like it's the, the main, the mid rib of the leaf turns into the actual pitcher itself. This generally will have liquid inside of it and there will also be a little kind of little hat at the top there, you might be able to see, there you go. Um, and this one specifically is one of the most common ones that you will find in most stores, not all the time, that's why I'm adding this in the collection, it does come up on occasion, at least here in the UK and I would imagine Europe. This is, I think, the Nepenthes ex ventrata or ventrata, I will add it at the top there. But this is one that a lot of people kind of are interested with, especially when they want to take up the next step, because in the beginning you're just like, oh, this might be a bit too much, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. This is a good one, and the reason why I've added it onto here, and let's look at the differences that I was talking about. Speed of growth, relatively fast growing plant, surprised even me. The other thing about this is ease of propagation, and let me see if I can show you one of my propagations. It's looking a bit janky, so do not judge. Looking very janky, but you might be able to see here, I've got it in a water jar, there are some foliage that have dried off and that was my bad, but literally this is just a jar of water and it's grown more foliage. Ooh, and there's even a picture that I hadn't seen that it's grown since. So the thing that most people don't realize about this plant is it's a vining plant. So you can see I've actually got some janky support sticks on there. So propagation, all you would do is not very obvious node, but if you cut between foliage and then put it in some water, I've had good success with water, so we'll talk about that it will grow quite, quite nicely. In terms of its care, and this is the thing that usually scares people off about this plant, but you shouldn't have to. Yes, some of them can be quite tricky, the ones that are the, the, the more expensive hybrids, and some of them are truly, truly beautiful. I think Red Leaf Exotics, and I'll see if I can link, I think there's a channel, 
I'll see if I can link the channel at the top there. Amazing, amazing people that have been doing loads of things with the mentees, much bigger experts than I will ever be. But this is an interesting one because if you manage to get your hands on this, at least from a lot of you actually that have been growing this for a while, I transferred this into damp sphagnum moss in a net pot because the thing you need to remember about this specific carnivorous plant, it's not a bog plant. This is still, I think, technically an aroid or at least an epiphyte. So it still needs air to go to its roots, as do most plants, as do some carnivorous plants, to be fair, even the boggy ones. But this one is one that I put into damp sphagnum moss. Now, a lot of you just kind of said, because this came in just pure cocoa coir, and I'm just like, oh no, this is probably not the right thing for it. What, what's this about? A lot of you just said, you know what, it grows quite happily in pure cocoa coir. Not all of them, as I said, some of the other hybrids will, I cannot attest to those, but I know from a lot of you that have said this, they've been growing it happily in just pure cocoa coir, like a regular pot, and it's been doing fine for them. I have hang it up, but you don't have to hang it up, basically. Now, the bonus little one that I will say about this one, if you're maybe not looking at something that you want to hang up or do all these things to, and you want more of a traditional carnivorous, boggy type plant, and this is the bonus one that I was talking about, something like a pingicula or pings or pinguicula pronunciation. <laughs> I will see if I've got a picture of one that I, I've I owned several over the years. I'll see if I can add a picture there. If not, I will find a picture and add it. But with the pingiculas, they, I think they're called butterworts as well. They're very kind of flat looking plants. The really interesting thing, and I think I learned this from Matt and Matthew and Stephen on Plant Daddy podcast, is during the wintry months where you can pull back a bit on the watering, it loses the stickiness. The leaves have got like sticky substance on and it's almost a bit like a yellow sticky trap for things like fungus gnats, so the little kind of fruit flies that you're seeing growing around. It won't probably catch like the standard kind of house flies, but it will catch things like the fungus gnats, possibly even maybe some fruit flies as well. But that one is more of a boggy plant, so you would grow it the same way that you would grow most of your carnivorous bog type plants. So it needs to have kind of water reservoir at the bottom, constantly sitting in water. The interesting thing with that is I found that it was quite simple to grow. And when it goes through that drier phase, it turns into a succulent pretty much. It loses that kind of stickiness and you can propagate it almost the same way that you can a succulent. I'm not going to go into too much detail with it, but if you want to look into more details, do a quick YouTube search for pinguiculas and their care, and you'll see how rewarding they can be. And essentially, it's a plant that's earning its keep. It's killing off those pesky little fungus gnats. So coming into the anthurium category, and the one plant, and I'll see if I can link, if I can lift it up. You see me like cringe because as always I've done watering so it's going to drip everywhere but let me see if I can pick one up. Ta -ta I managed to get it out and hopefully it's not going to drip everywhere. But this is an anthurium and this is one that some other people probably have spoken about but I will double down as everybody else did. Anthurium crystallinum. Yes, yes, yes. I would almost say and I know I might get some flack for this I would go, I, if, knowing what I know now, I would have gone for this instead of the Clarinervium. So much easier to grow this and a lot more interesting, I find, than the Clarinervium, if I'm being completely honest. This is also one of those plants, and again, talking about something like its speed, relatively fast growing Anthurium, I will say. So in relation to other Anthurium, so that's something that is a positive in its kind of territory there. In terms of propagation, very good kind of aerial rootage. This is looking quite compact, but my more mother plant has got more space. And also the other benefit of this is this was a pup of my mother plant. I'm pointing down. I'll see if I can add a picture here of my mother plant. My mother plant's foliage. So this is the size of the leaf in relation to my head. The mother plant, which is two or three years old now, maybe four. Those leaves are about three times the size of this now i think that had even bigger leaves but it took a knock back last winter and it's kind of like had to regrow its massive leaves but a really really good one and as i said pups so didn't even have to do too much this came out next to the mother plant so i just ripped it out and have since been growing it as its own 
plant. And this had leaves that were probably about this big about a year ago. So not a bad size up and it's going, it's getting faster as it goes along. Test wise for this, I would say maybe check for it from mealybugs. But other than that, I don't think I've ever had thrips or even spider mites on this. Some people might do it's a slightly velvety leaf. So you might get spider mites on occasion. So maybe something to look out for. And in terms of care, this is in semi-hydro mix for me. Most of my anthuriums grow in semi-hydro mix and they grow exceptionally well. So I would say if you're starting to think about growing anthuriums, this might be controversial because a lot of people will be like, go for a soil mix to begin with and learn on that. I would actually say, for me, if I was getting this advice from somebody, I would have wanted somebody to say, bypass the soil altogether. Even if you haven't done semi-hydro, try it. Try it with something like a crystallinum, which isn't that expensive. If you can't get it and you need to go for a clarinervium, <laughs> do it with a clarinervium. Just remove all the soil from the roots and move it into a semi-hydro mix. Thank me later, basically. And learn with that one. Both this one and the clarinervium can be quite forgiving for anthuriums, especially when they're moving into something like semi-hydro. So they're good ones to kind of do that transition. So there is a positive as well for that one when, when you're looking at its care. But other than that, does this need an awful lot of humidity? Yes, this might need a slight touch more humidity. Maybe the clarinervium is a bit more forgiving with the humidity, but I have got a bonus one for this one as well that doesn't need high humidity. And but yeah, other than that, just remembering to watering and remembering to fertilize it. It's a relatively straightforward anthurium to own. Now for the bonus one on this, this is the anthurium pedatum. Slightly harder to come by, so you might need to do a bit of searching for this one, but this is another one that has got very similar care to the crystallina that I was talking about before, but you get a lot more interesting foliage. So maybe this isn't one for the heart, hot leaf fans out there go for the crystalline that we were just showing a moment ago but this is definitely going to be a talking point it's a bit more like kind of hand shaped but this one hasn't got the velvety leaves this one i would imagine i've not grown it in a household conditions but based on how hardy this is this is probably one of my hardiest anthuriums even more so than the crystallinum this will probably be fine in a household condition but the reason why it's a bonus plant is it might not be for everybody. The leaf shape might not be for everybody. It's got very tall petioles and the leaves are at the top. But I still think this is a really good contender. Slightly trickier to the propagation, unlike the crystallinum, but probably just even that stretch more easy to care for than the crystallinum. On to the philodendrons. So the philodendrons, I will have one that is on here. I'll see if I can add some clips in on this because this is very difficult to pull down. And annoyingly, my other one is also very difficult to pull down. So I will show you the one that I want to talk about. Not that one, that's the bonus one. The philodendron Burley Marks Variegata. And this also fills another tick box, which is if you want to try a variegated houseplant, this is a good one to have. And... I have grown mine two different sizes. I'll see if I can find a picture of here of my original plant, which was almost to my height, if not maybe a bit taller. So I'm about 177 in meters. I have 10, I think that is. And yeah, it can grow super, super quickly. It's a good one to learn about propagation when it comes to kind of weird shapes because it doesn't have the usual stem. And again, I'll see if I can add a picture so you can see how it grows. It's a really awkward kind of shape not awkward but different it's still easy enough to propagate from and for me again coming into the propagation with that one a hundred percent success rate with that plant water soil propagation boxes all do really really well with that plant same with dams fang moss same with just perlite going straight into semi-hydro mixes fine this is not a plant that's get beat there is a caveat as there always will be that and this is good again this is a reason why i'm suggesting this is a next step up because there's learning opportunities with all of these as well remember what we're talking about with the clarinervium as well so the learning opportunity with this is twofold one on the variegation side of things so it's it's unstable variegation i found at least with mine maybe i lucked out and it it stayed relatively consistent with this variegation at some point the mother plant started getting a lot of green i left it there or you can cut off those green sections and then propagate and have 
a non-variegated or a reverted Burley Marx variegata philodendron. <laughs> it's no longer variegata, it's just a Burley Marx philodendron, which will grow even faster. And, and I've done that several times. There's so many gifts to friends. So that's one thing. So you, you can learn about chopping back plants when, you, when it's going towards reversion and it won't skip too many beats and it will go back to its reverted state. Not reverted, variegated state. That's the word I was looking for. But the other thing, the other learning opportunity with this one is patience. And this is the thing, it's a fast plant, not in the beginning. And this is the thing that most people don't realize about the philodendron burley marks variegata. It takes a minute to root out. And by a minute, I might mean a few months to almost a year. So bear that in mind going into it. Do not get disheartened. It's just like it hasn't done anything in like months. I was the same. A lot of other people have been the same. Bear with it. I'm quite glad I listened to a lot of other people when I first got it because there was a few people that had it. And they just said, just hold on. Just hold on, and it will go crazy fast. Completely true. And I can see, because I've grown this plant now in semi-hydro in clear pots, I can see that point where it's deeply rooted into the semi-hydro, which, as I said, could take six months to a year. At that point, it starts growing like the clappers, basically. So very fast plant, as long as you can be patient for those first few months or even year, and then you'll be fine. You might get a fully rooted plant that's already growing quite happily. Bonus if you can do that. So there's that to remember. The bonus one for this plant, for this type of plant, actually, the philodendron is the one behind me. And again, I'll see if I can add a picture here, which is one that not a lot of people talk about. It might not be as easy to find, not because it's exceptionally rare, it's because it doesn't come up on the market as often, which is the philodendron painted lady. Another one that's giving kind of variegated vibes. It isn't. It's the way that the leaf grows in. And I will add pictures and I will say the same thing that absolutely every other person on YouTube or Instagram anywhere has said. Pictures and videos truly do not do the foliage of this plant justice. There is a good reason why it's called the Painted Lady. It does look like kind of brush strokes of kind of oil paintings. And it does not carry well in pictures and videos. When you see it in real life, you will get what I mean. Similar to the philodendron Burley Marks, this is a relatively easy care philodendron, relatively fast growing, I find in my care, or consistent growing, maybe not fast growing, but consistently growing. The leaves will always be of interest because it's not variegation that could revert. It does bring out aerial roots for days, so easy enough to propagate. Same thing goes for the Burley Marks variegata. So it's a good viable option and it's an interesting looking plant. And I will say again, the, the point I was trying to make about it not translating well to videos or photos, I was fortunate enough once to be with a friend who was getting into plants and growing her collection. And she saw one of these in a plant store when we were both there at the same time. And she just thought, I've always dismissed this, but oh my God, this is amazing. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. But unless you see it in real life, you won't ever truly, truly get that. So take my word for it. And if you do ever manage to see it in the store, if you're even vaguely interested, I think that will make up your mind quite quickly. And you will be like, right, this is coming home with me now for the right price, obviously. But yeah, those two are the big suggestions that I would have for philodendrons. Coming into my Hoya section here, and this again is different Hoyas that you can step up from the traditional kind of Hoya Carnosa and all of those kind of more Wayeti eyes, the, the shepherd eyes, shepherd eye, the more traditional kind of Hoyas. And this isn't going to be the super wow and very difficult to find Hoyas, but maybe the slightly more tricky to find on occasion. I mean, most of these, both of these plants, I think at this point here where I'm based in the UK, and Europe, they do come up more frequently on the market, but one being, and again, I don't, I have pictures because one of these, this one, the Hoya linearis, lives in my garden and also has overwintered in the greenhouse two years running. And that should tell you something about it. <laughs> this is the plant that I put out into the garden at some point just to see how it's going to do and maybe retire it off. And by retire, I mean it was probably going to die in the winter. It didn't. 
two winters in a row now, I do bring it into an unheated greenhouse in the UK with the UK winters. And it has survived two winters in the greenhouse and then comes out every summer and enjoys life in the sun, basically, or in the heat, not the sun. This is still a tropical plant that needs shaded when you're bringing it out. But very, very rewarding plant in terms of its care. Both the Hoya linearis and my bonus plant are Hoyas that do like to dry out. But if they stay slightly more moist, it's not as much of an issue because that's always going to be your challenge with Hoyas is there's a very fine line in terms of watering them just right or overwatering them. So both of these Hoyas, both the Linearis and the bonus one, don't have an issue with if you kind of maybe water it a bit too quickly. It, they're much more forgiving, basically. Both, I will say, do like a bit of a temperature drop. The Linearis specifically does need that. So I always found that around autumn time is when it would bloom. So it needs that temperature drop a bit in the autumn. And when it does bloom, it's got these delightful flowers. And most people think they don't smell. But go and give it a sniff if you do get the Linearis at night. The blooms have got a lovely lemony scent. So there, there's that, basically. Relatively simple to propagate. So many people have propagated the Linearis. It's a very interesting looking plant as well because of the way that it will grow. It's very much, if you want something to hang up high and it will kind of create a column of green without going bushy, this is one for you. I remember I had a friend a years back that came in and just took the Linearis and was using it as hair around, but... <laughs> got interesting friends uh, but it's an interesting one easy relatively easy to propagate put those two leaves and they will grow as there's usually aerial roots on every single one of the nodes so it's really really simple and it's a different looking plant does it need specific conditions no i've grown it in household conditions and it was fine as long as it's getting some light and you're remembering to water it fine really really simple plant now the bonus plant is one and mine is looking a bit janky but this one has also summered outside because this one had some pests that I was trying to get rid of and the summering outside for my Hoyas tends to get rid of the pests quite easily. Now the Linearis doesn't have a pest issue, this one for me has done and that's why I'm including it because this is an interesting one. This by the way, sorry I should have mentioned, is the Hoya Polynura or the Fishtail Hoya and do ap apologies for quite how scraggly it's looked. It has had root rot a couple of times. And considering what it still looks like, it's doing fine. Um, but the big pest on this one, and the reason why I'm including it, it has all the other benefits that the Linearis would have. It's a slightly more interesting shape of the leaf. And I mean, a lot of people do love the foliage because it does look like mermaid tails or fish tails. This one for me has been a Bane when it comes to mealybugs. So the reason why I'm including this in, especially if you're going to do that step up, this is a really good way for you to start familiarizing it, familiarizing, familiarizing yourself with pest management and specifically pest management for mealybugs. There's an awful lot of nooks and crannies on this. And if you do get some mealybugs on this, you are going to, this is going to challenge you. But again, you're wanting to do that step up. These are the things that you need to become comfortable with and familiar with when you start looking at getting more intricate kind of foliage plants in that might be very pest prone. Some I'm thinking of some of your velvety type plants. You're going to have to deal with a lot of this basically. So this is a good one to learn on and surprisingly forgiving. This one is not quite as straightforward at uh, propagation, although it is relatively easy at propagation. You can kind of quickly take a cutting, let it root out, and you will start getting vines relatively fast. This is not one of the slowest Hoyas that I had, but this is a good contender. That's why I put it in as a bonus. And then wrapping up with the final kind of category, which is Syngoniums. And a lot of you might say, you know what, Syngoniums are relatively straightforward. How is this a step up? But some of the Syngoniums can get a bit more interesting rather than just your traditional kind of green or the, the neon Syngoniums, which is slightly on the pink side. So for instance, this is the one that I want to talk about. This is the Syngonium Chia Pence. 
And this is not one that a lot of people talk about. Some people don't like the, the leaf shape. It's slightly different than most syngoniums. It's slightly more heart-shaped leaves. But oh my, let me tell you the texture of these leaves. I don't know how to describe it. It's something between, it's not velvet. It's kind of almost like a textured rubber. It's really, really interesting and very, very cool. And the reason why I'm including it, it's a nice, easy syngonium to kind of move on to that. I've got this growing on a moss pole, but to be fair, this isn't even one that you do need to run, like grow on a moss pole. This will kind of trail down quite happily. You might just get smaller foliage. I wanted it on a pole to see if I can get this two sides up, and it has done so quite nicely. It roots out like mad, as most syngoniums would do, and I will show you some of the roots there. Hopefully, it will focus. And... I will do the same on the moss pole, and you might be able to see some of those gorgeous roots coming down there. But relatively simple care with this one, as with most syngoniums, and you'd be surprised with a lot of these syngoniums that might be slightly harder to find, they're still syngoniums. They're still easy care, still easy to propagate. I mean, look at that little aerial root there. You can easily cut that and propagate it, so that's not a problem at all. In terms of care with this one, this is growing in my conservatory, but I would imagine, I think there's people that grow this in regular household humidity, and you get that slightly velvety leaf, even though it really isn't, but without any of the real hassle. Pest-wise, so far I have not had any pests on this, but the ones that you might want to keep out are maybe the occasional mealybug. And the other one that I wanted to talk about, the bonus one, I don't have it here, it's upstairs in my office, I'll hopefully get a picture, is the Syngonium Lanocarti Road, basically. I think there might be another one. Is it Erythrophyllum? I might be wrong, but I will add the name at the top. Very, very cool Syngonium, because the difference within that Syngonium is you tend to get very deep green leaves, and the backs of the leaves are red, like a bright, not bright, like a deep red. So that's the one that I find is really good as well if you want to kind of attempt growing plants that might do okay in slightly lower light conditions. That one does do quite well in slightly lower light conditions. That one I'm not growing on a moss pole and I'm letting it trail down. And to be fair, yes, the leaves have got a bit smaller, but they're still relatively sizable and it's giving me what I needed to give me basically. Because, because of the way that it trails, I get to see both that deep green and that red on the back quite frequently. So that is one that might be an interesting one as a step up after kind of having the more common syngoniums. So I'm really curious, did any of these surprise you? Did you kind of look at it and go, oh, yes, actually, I, I would definitely want to try that. Also, if you're one of the more experienced people that have been doing this for a while, do you agree with me on some of these? Do you want to have some of your own suggestions which aren't the usual kind of plants that people might kind of consider transitioning to straight after their more common house plants that they can get kind of more or less everywhere. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.